Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Today we're going to be worshiping under the theme that God tests the heart. And my message will be from Mark chapter 9 this morning. And we'll see one of those tests of the heart is to see if there is true humility. In which we find what's behind me, true greatness. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with true hearts and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of our Lord, the God of grace and of glory, dear Christian friends. We live in a world that idolizes greatness. For example, for years, Pizza Hut lured us to buy their pizza by telling us that they were making it great. Tony the Tiger still roars that his frosted flakes are great. And some 40 years ago, remember those Miller Lite commercials? Miller Lite became a household name with those commercials in which they bragged that their beer was less filling, but also tastes great. Many want to be greater than great. Muhammad Ali proclaimed repeatedly to the boxing world, I am the greatest. The baseball player Ricky Henderson, after setting the record for stolen bases for a career, told a national TV audience, now I am the greatest of all time. And on many a coffee mug are found the words, world's greatest father, mother, husband, wife, son, daughter, boss, secretary, golfer, and the list goes on and on. Everyone wants to be considered the greatest or at least great at something. I went old school and got out my old Webster dictionary at home and looked up what great means. By definition, here's what it says. Great means notable, remarkable, exceptionally outstanding, distinguished, famous, important, highly significant or consequential. Boy, that sounds rather appealing, doesn't it? Everyone wants to be considered great. But how do we become great? You can go out into the world and ask people for the secret, but a better answer is found in God's word. So today, let's listen as Jesus teaches us what makes us great. What makes us great? We'll find that, it's cent that it, it revolves around faith that is centered in both the cross and the crown. And then in a life, a life responding in humble service. Jesus had just given a glimpse of his greatness up on the Mount of Transfiguration, where he was joined by two Old Testament greats, Moses and Elijah. Coming down from the mountain, he happened upon the tragic scene of a demon-possessed boy and his desperate father. A scene which Jesus used as an opportunity to show that he was greater than Satan as he drove that demon out. And now it, it was time to move on. 
And so we were told they left that place and they passed through Galilee. The last trip through this region that Jesus would make as he was making his way to Jerusalem to suffer and die. And as we pointed out over the last few weeks, Jesus intended this to really be more of a private trip as he attempted to schedule time alone with his disciples. That's why Mark goes on to tell us this in verse 31. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. Well, the transfiguration had the disciples flying high. Remember how excited Peter was? He tried to persuade Jesus up on that mountain to just build some shelters and so they could just stay there. But Jesus had to get the disciples back to the reality of what awaited him in Jerusalem. So again, he speaks quite frankly, and this is what he tells them. The son of man is going to be destroyed and be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. Notice two things are emphasized by our Lord. First, he speaks of the cross he would have to bear. Oh, yes, he had predicted his death before, but this time he adds the element of betrayal. It would be someone close to him. But he not only mentions the cross, but he also points his disciples to the crown. He says, my life's going to come to an end, but I'm not going to remain in the grave. See, his cross of suffering would be changed into a crown of glory. And Jesus even specifies the exact time period, three days between the cross and the crown. So here in some of the simplest words he would ever use, Jesus redirects the attention of the disciples to his death and resurrection. That's where they would witness Jesus' true glory. That's where they would see his greatness. Well, trying to make sense of Jesus' words with what they had seen up on that Mount of Transfiguration, well, it's proving to be too much for these disciples. Listen in verse 32. They did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. No doubt Peter, James, and John had told the other disciples all about this, that glimpse of glory they had seen up on the mountain. To so quickly switch gears from that glorious vision of Jesus to now trying to picture a suffering and dying Messiah, oh, that had their heads just spinning. The disciples, you see, they were still hung up on looking for that earthly Messiah. So any talk of Jesus' death, well, they just wouldn't accept it because it would ruin their dreams. Perhaps they were, they were afraid to ask questions because they're so stunned to hear Jesus speak of being betrayal, of being betrayed. Since that meant that, that someone close to him and close to them would be responsible for his death. Perhaps it was a combination of ignorance and fear that kept the disciples silent. Or, as we will soon learn, there was something else occupying their thoughts. Well, you and I, we can't excuse the short-sightedness of the disciples, but in a way we can understand it. Our Lord's mission had yet to be completed. You and I. We have no excuse at all for not staying centered on the cross and the crown of our Lord. We know why he went to that cross, did so for our sins. And we know why he now wears a crown, because he's back on his heavenly throne as our triumphant savior. So let's keep that wonderful gospel message at the forefront of what we do as a church, especially when far too many churches have shifted to an emphasis of, of social and, and political reform. Uh, and become more concerned about the physical and temporal rather than the spiritual and eternal. No wonder there's so much confusion in the Christian marketplace today as to what churches should be doing. Well, let's not add to the confusion. Keep centered on the fact that Jesus atoned for our sins on the cross and he assured our greatness in heaven by being crowned as a resurrected savior. Let's keep people's faith where it belongs, centered in the cross and the crown. It's important to keep our faith centered. To do so, it needs to be a functioning faith. And you see, we're considered great in God's eyes through Christ when we also live a life that responds to his love in humble service to others. Okay, now we find out what had been on the minds of the disciples, adding their confusion over Jesus' words. Verses 33 and 34 says, They came to Capernaum. 
And when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? They kept quiet because of the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Really? That's what had been on their minds. What had brought about such a debate in the first place? I kind of think maybe the three disciples that came down from the mountain, maybe they were bragging a little bit about the privilege of being chosen to do so. I don't know. Whatever the reason, you have a selfless savior who already knew about the selfish ramblings that had been the centerpiece of his disciples' conversation while they were traveling. His question presented them an opportunity for repentance, but their silence must have been deafening because they could only hang their heads like naughty children who had just been caught with their hands in the cookie jar. Well, what does make a person great? It's time for Jesus to put an end to his disciples' arrogant arguing. This is what he tells them. Listen closely. If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. It's all, about some, it's all about humble service. C.S. Lewis once wrote that true humility doesn't mean thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It doesn't mean thinking less of yourself necessarily, but thinking of yourself less. See, the disciples, they were all about themselves. Where they ranked, who was the most important, how great they would be in Jesus' kingdom. But Jesus tells them that none of them was the boss. They really weren't even middle management, if you think about it. They were to be the last, the servant of all. Being great had nothing to do with being first. It was all about putting others ahead of themselves. It was all about humble service. And that meant the willingness to be a servant to everyone. So Jesus now makes use of a visual to get his point across. Following verses 36 and 37, he took a little child and had him stand among them. Taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. In, in Matthew's gospel, we're told Jesus also said this, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So the disciples were to take themselves down to the level of this little child that Jesus had standing in front of him, to, to have that kind of unquestioning trust and genuine humility of a child, because then they would start to uncover what brings true greatness. We can't help but notice the contrast presented to the disciples that day. Here you have the glorious Savior standing before them with his arms wrapped around a little child. Instead of jealously clinging to his own heavenly glory, here Jesus again shows that he had made himself nothing to take on flesh and enter our world. The same one who calls us to enter the kingdom of God like little children and to serve his little ones in his name, well, he himself became a child in Bethlehem for us. Instead of jumping on the self-serving bandwagon, Jesus left behind heaven's glory and the eternal praise of angels to be born a human destined for suffering. And instead of pondering the underappreciated and overwhelming nature of his mission, our Lord's every thought was focused on this, on saving you and me. In humble service, Jesus puts you and me first. And that would make, that's what makes him so great. Recognizing how Jesus humbly stepped in for us to, to secure our salvation. We'll, we'll strive to respond accordingly with that same humble service. I'll tell you, because we're sinners, it won't be easy. Because the sin of pride need not fear extinction as long as there's life on the selfish world. It's hard to be thinking about the needs of someone else when I'm thinking about myself. You may have been familiar with Muhammad Ali's proclamation, I am the greatest, but here's one you may not have heard. He was on an airplane one time. The flight attendant came up to him, politely asking him to put on his seatbelt, to which Ali said, the greatest, or to, to which Ali said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And not missing a beat, the, the flight attendant said, Superman don't need no plane. And being humbled by that, Muhammad Ali sheepishly put on his seatbelt. From little on, the lure of greatness. 
never really goes away. Not this side of heaven. From the toddler who defiantly shoves his plate across the dinner table to the troubled teen whose only reason to exist seems to be to buck authority and to the clock punching office worker wholeheartedly believing that they're worth far more than the company could ever pay them. We all want our way. We all want to be number one. We come first and everyone else has to get in line behind us. We fail to serve those in need because we're not looking at their needs. So completely engrossed are we in our own little fishbowls. And so consumed are we with creating what we need when we want it. To which we must all proclaim, Lord, have mercy. Only by elevating Christ can we, earn, can we learn to lower ourselves. Only by taking in all that he has done to save us can we be moved to serve others. Humbly serve and joyfully give of yourself, not because it will save you, but because you have been saved and set free in Christ. I imagine if you, each of you knows someone already doing just that. Because certain faces of people in our congregation came to my mind as I was working on this sermon. People who faithfully have served their Savior by giving up precious hours to do church work on boards or committees, to care for the church grounds inside and out, to help reach out to fellow members who are hurting, to welcome and assist visitors who come to worship. These are people that don't necessarily want to be singled out with any special attention or mention of the bulletin or some kind of plaque to put on their wall at home. No, they're not doing it for the recognition. They're just humbly serving their Savior by showing love for him and for others. Would you call these people great? They may not be rich. Their names may not be found in any headline, and they may not hold any World records have any great inventions on their resume or any life-saving cures to their credit. But they're still great. They're great not necessarily in the eyes of the unbelieving world, but in the eyes of their Lord. And isn't that what counts? As one theologian so aptly puts it, the smaller we grow in our own estimation, the greater do we become in the sight of God. See, greatness in God's kingdom is not about the advancement of self. It's about dying to self and being raised to a new life with, with, with our Savior. By centering our faith in his cross and his crown, we're motivated to respond with a life of humble service. And that's where we'll find greatness. In him who set us free from sin. Free to serve. Free to love. And free to be great. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord of hosts, you oppose the proud. You give grace to the humble. Help us by your spirit to submit ourselves to you and resist the devil that he would flee from us. Lord of hosts, give our synods leaders and all pastors the wisdom that comes down from above, that they may be peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Let them sow among us in peace and grant a harvest of righteousness. Lord of hosts, pacify our passions by your spirit that we may not be ruled by the jealousy and selfish ambition that give rise to disorder and every vile practice. Lord of hosts, uphold this world in your order. Preserve the church and the preaching of your word against all enemies. Bless our homes that parents and children may serve one another faithfully and grow in instruction and faith until life's end. Give health and wisdom to all who serve in public office, that their authority may be exercised for the benefit of our people. Lord of hosts, look with kindness on the sick and those in any need, especially the family of Nate Silo, who was called home to you this past week and whose soul now rejoices with you in heaven. 
comfort those who mourn. Give them strength in your promises and bless them with the sure hope of reunion in heaven. O Lord of hosts, grant that what we ask from you may not be squandered after our passions, but sought rightly in faith, that we may rightly receive them and put them to service for you and our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, I pray that you have a, a blessed week. The Lord go, the Lord goes with you as you live your life here on this earth. So I know he'll be watching over you and keeping you safe. Hope to see you soon. Until then, God's blessings to you and yours. Thanks. <laughs>